Welcome back troglodytes to the Troglies Guitar Show. What better way to bring in the new JC era of Gibson than by featuring the brand new Les Paul Standard 60s on the show. Word on the street is I visited Sweetwater yesterday and I bought many of these new 2019 models for full documentations. So if you're interested in seeing more of the 2019 lineup, definitely subscribe today. But for this episode, let's dig into this new 60s Les Paul standard. Here she is in all of her glory, the new Les Paul standard 60s. Now, if you're new to the channel, make sure you check out this episode guide over here because I go very in depth with these reviews. I'm not just gonna Google all over this thing and say, oh yeah, it's so great. I'm gonna show you every last inch of this guitar and we're gonna talk so much about it, you're probably gonna click off of the video before the end. So let's first start off with a little bit about the specs of this instrument. New for the second half of 2019 is the Les Paul Standard 60s and Les Paul Standard 50s. Notice there's no 2019 in the title anywhere when you shop for these things online, which honestly makes it a little bit confusing and hard to find on some of their websites. But the main difference between those two models comes down to the neck size. The 60s ones have obviously a 60s neck profile, but let me tell you, this is not super thin. It's not like an SG thin neck profile by any means. It still has a pretty nice girth to it. I visited Sweetwater and I played both a 50s and 60s version. And for me, the 60s came home because it had a way nicer top and it felt better in my hands. Another difference between the two models lies within the tuners. The 60s gets the Grover Rotomatic tuners, whereas the 50s version gets the Klusen style. Another difference lies within the knobs. The 60s version gets the gold reflector top hat knobs. The 50s version gets the ambered styled ones. Personally, I prefer the other ones, but there's something about these reflectors that I think looks good with the little pick guard sticker. You've got the nice shiny hardware on here. I think it looks awesome. But another difference that doesn't get talked about a lot is the finish options. So the 60s, they are offered an iced tea, which is this one, a bourbon burst, and one called unburst. Whereas the 50s version actually gets kind of four different finishes here. You get a gold top, a heritage cherry sunburst, and a tobacco sunburst. And I say four because there's also a P90 version of that instrument available with a gold top finish. So it's not a question of which is the better model, it's which is the better model for your personal tastes. Spec wise, these return to tradition with no weight relief. If you're not a Gibson fan, you don't really understand what the hype behind weight relief and not having it on a Les Paul standard is. It was in 2007 when Gibson started to chamber out the Les Paul standards. But weight relief as a whole started in 1983. So really having any Gibson that is completely solid all throughout here is kind of uncommon nowadays and it's a very welcomed feature. But at what price does that cost us? Well, we now have nine and a half to 10 pound Les Pauls. But let me tell you, that sounds scary but this thing actually feels pretty darn good. It doesn't feel as heavy as it is, so I'm happy to report that. They both feature double A maple tops. Personally, I think this one could be graded maybe a little bit higher. I like it anyways. You get a rosewood fretboard. This one desperately needs some conditioning. You get a graph tech nut now instead of tectoid, and you have your traditional mahogany neck on this thing. So these really do go back to the tradition of Gibson and creates them kind of how they were in the 50s and 60s. But we're not done talking about this yet. Let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench and take an up close look at this. Cause I know you guys are dying to know, is this actually a real ABR1 bridge? And do we have a long neck tenon like some people promised us at NAMM? Let's find out. Oh, the moment of truth. To be 100% honest with you guys, I bought this guitar strictly just to take the neck pickup out because nobody's done it yet. What neck tenon is in this thing? 
Is it long neck or short neck? Because this means a lot to me. Short neck tenon. So if you're wondering what the difference between this and a historic is, you're going to have a long neck tenon in a historic. When I heard somebody say that these new standards were going to have long neck tenons, I thought, well, what's the point of buying a historic? Because, hey, we've got an ABR1 bridge, right? No, this is not an ABR1 bridge, guys. Gibson is lying to you. Yes, it is an ABR1 bridge, but it sits in posts. They've been doing this for a few years now. That's not a true ABR1. A true ABR1 is drilled directly into the top. And that's why people like those things is because they transfer the vibrations directly into the wood. You don't have the post and then the stud in the body. So Gibson, I'm okay with you advertising that these have ABR1 bridges because clearly they do. It says Gibson ABR1, but they're not mounted in a traditional way. So there's two differences there. And obviously your top car will be a little bit different. Some of your other specs will be different. Headstock shape and size tuners. There's a bunch of minute differences. So if you're wondering if you should get like an older historic or one of these, both are great options, but these do not have historic Les Paul specs. They're just kind of like a tribute. Inside of our neck pickup cavity here, you can see it reads IT. That means the IT guy needed to do some repairs on the electron. I'm just kidding. It stands for ice T. Then it appears we have some sort of X right there. Very nice and clean routes. It doesn't look like we have any dull router bits like we were seeing on some of the other 2019s in the Henry era of 2019. And the bridge pickup on this one, Les Paul Standard 60s. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe it's a small N. But again, very, very nice routes. I like to see that. They've definitely stepped their game up there. And you can see the center seam of the two-piece maple top with the mahogany body. As far as the pickup goes, we have the Rhythm and Lead 61. These are burst bucker pickups. Within the circuit, the bridge pickup reads 7.73k ohms, and you have a 7.8 in the neck. And just for fun, the middle is a 3.88. Before I put these back in, we'll take a quick look at the pickup rings. That's another difference if you get a historic spec guitar, is the plastics will be very different. They'll feel sturdier and have more vintage correct appointments to it. And here's something else that's a really nice feature. This is a lightweight aluminum tailpiece. So when they tell you, oh, the tailpiece is different, it's because it's lightweight. People like these, they say it gives you better tone. But what I'm interested in seeing is that they're still using the Advanced Plating Incorporated company. I saw Gibson dumping a bunch of this hardware through an outlet on eBay. So I was wondering if they were changing suppliers or not. No, they're just kind of changing what style they're using. We can take a nice close look at these knobs. They're labeled volume, volume, tone, tone. That can be helpful if you're starting out, but for everyone else, it's just kind of a historically accurate thing. And you also have the knob pointers, sometimes referred to as thumb bleeders. They let you know what position you're on approximately. Here's what our pick guard's looking like. You can see this one still has the protective coating on it. So once you take that off, that little sticker does disappear. However, here's something else I'm gonna knock Gibson on. They need to find a way to prevent this from happening. I get it. Over the years, it might indent into the finish, but this thing's brand spanking new. It's only a few months old, and it's already chipped the finish just by sitting on it. That kind of upsets me because this is a pretty darn nice top. I could see somebody wanting to pick guard off this model, but now you really can't because you have this undisclosed ding that no dealer's gonna take the pick guard off to see if it's there or not. So if you're a pick guard off guy, definitely ask that question because that kind of upsets me. Running up the rosewood fretboard here, I did lightly condition it with Dunlop 65 Lem Oil. This stuff is not true lemon oil. You should not use real lemon oil on your instrument. You can use whatever type of oil you like, though, to darken your fretboard up and keep it conditioned. I always find the new stuff is very dry. I kind of like these inlays. I mean, they're not real mother of pearl, but they've got some decent figuring to it. Something I like about this one is all the way down at the second to last inlay, when I'm playing it, this one turns a darker shade than the rest. It's kind of interesting. 
So now the big question, you know, how is the fret work? We've seen some pretty shoddy fret jobs here from Gibson. And it looks like you still have a little bit of tooling marks, but I mean, that just comes from being a handmade instrument. You can see a few light, deeper looking ones right there. So I really think Gibson has a long way to go as far as quality control goes. I mean, I don't necessarily think these small tooling marks are bad, but what is just awful on this example is take a look at this nut. There is a filing gap between the nut and the fretboard where it just kind of slopes down. This should have never left the factory like that. Here's a better angle where you can see that. But I decided to not let that bother me since this has such a nice top on it and played so well. Also, please do keep in mind as we're going over these small tooling marks on the fretboard, these are exaggerated under my very bright lights. In regular lighting situations, they do not appear anywhere near as evident as they might in this situation. The truss rod cover reads standard. They also ship it with a spare blank one because, hey, saying standard on the truss rod cover is not a 50s or 60s spec. Thankfully, the truss rod's in good shape on this. Believe me, I've received new Gibsons with truss rods that are maxed out. But we have the Les Paul silk screen here on the headstock and a pearl-looking Gibson logo. Gibson says these should be a 1.69 inch nut width. I'm getting 1.67. At the 12th fret, 2.06. Here's something that'll be helpful. First fret neck depth, 0.82. Then it increases to 0.92. So it's nice and slim, but not too slim. And as advertised, a 24 and 3 quarters inch scale. Now onto the back side. This is a beautiful two-piece mahogany back. That'd be another different from a historic spec. Many of those get one-piece backs, not all of them. But now another moment of truth. What do the new inside cavities look like? Interesting. Gibson's been tooting their horn about this, but they refuse to ever show a cavity. You do have your orange drop capacitors, and this is looking pretty good. I almost thought, is there no ground wire to this? Did they go back to Norland era? No, it's just coming in from like right there. So they're going back to the shielded tin plating. So it's not like historic spec where you won't have that and the pots will just be like sitting against the wood. So that's another slight difference right there. You can also see they use kind of a minimalistic cavity in order to get the wires here. Sometimes those are pretty large depending on what weight relief you have. And again, this is completely solid mahogany here. And now underneath here, oh, would you look at that? Nothing too special to look at. <laughs> it is interesting how the stain doesn't really catch in these areas though. And that's something else I want to kind of take a minute just to fully absorb here. The back is not super, super dark cherry. It's kind of slightly lighter in color, more like how I think of an SG. I really dig this. I think it looks great. The back side of the neck here, you have very tight grain mahogany. And again, it is a slim 60s neck profile, but not overly slim. Now, when we get to the back of the headstock, we have Grover tuners. Since this is the 60s model, you no longer have a model year underneath the Made in USA stamp, and they went back to the traditional serial number. Man, it's really difficult trying to educate people nowadays that this is a good thing, because I get so many comments of people saying, how do you get 2019 from 10? Oh my goodness, guys. Okay, it was around 2014 when Gibson started doing that, so we have five years to educate people of how it's been done since 1977, with the exception of the limited edition year of 1994. So it's year, day, 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 year. So 2019 in production on the 66th day of the year. This one tells you what batch. If it's zero, that means it's first batch. If it's a one, it's the second. And then this tells you the production number within that batch. And this one was 240, yeah, it looks like maybe the sixth for the day. And it's not necessarily the completion date of the instrument, it's just when the neck was stamped. 
But why this is so cool and significant that they're bringing this back and it makes me happy is it brings back the opportunity to buy a birthday guitar and like an anniversary guitar or, you know, your child was just born, you want a guitar that was stamped on their date of birth, something like that, because now we know exactly what day this thing was stamped. And that is a beautiful thing. Gibson, please never change that. Now let's take a quick look around the side. A lot of new people to Gibson think this is a defect. That's the maple cap exposed because you have thin binding in the cutaway. That is seen as a premium feature. Not all models have that. That's pretty much the only interesting spec that we can look at here besides the output jack plate here. A historic one would have one made of plastic. Even though technically these metal ones are superior, they won't crack on you and you've just got the regular style strap buttons on these. And hey, just for fun, why don't we look around this other edge too? With the solid mahogany back, this one weighs nine pounds, 11.9 ounces. The average for these does appear to be in the nine and a half to 10 pound range. This one, it doesn't feel as heavy as it is, and you can find some occasionally right around nine pounds, which is what I personally think is the best weight for a Les Paul. So now that we know all the specs of this instrument, what makes it up and some of its history, let's finally hear how the new Les Paul standard sounds. <laughs> It's really nice and jazzy. But then your bridge pickup, it's nice and bitey. And I love the chiminess of the middle position. Now let's do some distorted tones. So let me illustrate these new pots for you. That's a pretty heavily distorted tone, right? Roll this down to seven. It's not as distorted. Take it down another three notches to four. Two. My only 
only complaint here is it seems to just completely shut off at one and a half. That's exactly one and a half. So that's a good thing, but maybe it's a little bit too good at what it does. <laughs> But a cool feature when you have responsive pots like this is you can play some clean stuff. Now that we know how this instrument sounds, what are my final opinions on this thing? I'm not hiding from you guys. I think it's just more important to look at this, but I'm gonna truly tell you right now, I think these are some of the best standards Gibson has ever made. They're not perfect, but they're pretty darn good. I think quality control still has a long way to go. Remember how I told you I played the 60s and the 50s version? The other reason why I rejected that 50s one is the nut was not cut right. It was way too low for the G string. It was buzzing and it wouldn't quite ring out open. I also see quite a few of these demo models out there that have small little blemishes and that was just on launch day. So I think Gibson's getting there. You've got a fantastic lineup for traditionalists now. I'm very interested to see what type of limited editions they might do. So up your quality control and I think you guys are onto something big here. Gibson is coming back, but that doesn't mean that these are necessarily perfect right now. How much is one of these things running at the store? Retail is $24.99. And even at full retail value, I feel these things are definitely worth it. But before we end this, let's go ahead and take a look at the case and the case candy. If you decide to purchase one of these, you get a Gibson tan hard shell case like this with a nice red interior. But here is your case candy. A Gibson branded strap. The baby photo of it being set up on the tech bench. A blank truss rod cover. Warranty owner's manual and pre-pack checklist. Black polishing cloth and the Gibson multi-tool. If you enjoyed this in-depth look at the new Gibson Les Paul Standard 60s and you're in the market, hey, this one's for sale. I just buy these for the review. I can't afford to keep these because, hey, I've got to review other models now. So you can check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale page. Thank you, Troglodytes, for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.